here because I'm living out on time today and I got to wrap up everything today. So, in our Satan series, Satan and his devices. All right, so let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll jump into our study today. Father, thank you again for the opportunity we have to study your word. I thank you that we can be approved workmen that need not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. And Father, as we look at this topic of our adversary, the devil, and we look at his devices and we look at what the Bible says about Lucifer and Satan and the deceiver and all the names that he goes by, I pray, Father, that we would be wise to understand what he's like but yet dependent on you to be able to overcome him and overcome the evil that's in the world today with the good that you are and uh, you're a good father you're you're the source of good you're the source of love you're the source of hope you're the source of peace and father i pray that as we go through this this time period of the church age i pray father that we would represent you in a in a knowledgeable and also in an accurate way, according to what your word says. So help us to learn from your word this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, I've got to finish the series today, so I'm going to kind of move pretty quick. Next week we'll be doing a new Bible study. Uh, the ladies are going to meet together and guys are going to meet together. And uh, it'll be a little different format, video-based and teacher-based at the same time. Uh, I don't know which room we're going to be in yet, but Sue and I will coordinate that. Sue's going to lead the ladies one and I'm going to leave the men's one and uh, I think that'll be a, a, a good time of getting to know each other accountability and then also um, uh, a, a great topic so that we're going to be studying but this morning we're going to look at Satan's power so we've been looking at Satan's characteristics over the last several what now six weeks going on seven weeks this week looking at Satan and his devices and his background his history his power is what we're going to focus on this morning. And then uh, I got a closing illustration. So let's, uh, let's move ahead pretty quickly here this morning, but we're going to be accurate to what's going on. So the first thing we're going to notice is this, that people can be held captive by Satan, um, but not if you're a believer. So if you're an unbeliever, people can be held captive by Satan. Listen to what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9 says. It says, The coming of the lawless one is by activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. Today, what is the big movement in churches? They want signs and wonders, right? We want to see the mysterious. We want to see the supernatural. We want to see the sensational. Well, we got to be careful on that because not all signs and sensation, sensationality comes from God. Remember, when Moses threw his staff down, what happened? Turned into a snake. When Pharaoh's magicians threw their staffs down, what happened? They turned into snakes, plural. How many snakes left the room? <laughs> One, right? Because greater is he who's in us than he that is in the world. God showed his power over Satan by using sensational things. Uh, there's a lot of illustrations where we could go through the Bible and see this, but... I want to keep moving this morning. Death is his realm. Satan's realm is death. When you look at the death angel in the Old Testament, who is the death angel? It's Satan. So when the death angel came to Egypt and looked for the blood on the door, who was it? It's Satan. And why could he not touch the doors that had the blood on it? He's, he's limited in his power. God can limit Satan's ability. So when we see these things in the Bible, we don't have to sit there and say, wow, what good angel in heaven would kill a bunch of people? That's kind of morbid. Well, he's not a good angel. And he's the king of death. And uh, he is sovereign over the realm of death. And uh, so we got to understand that. Hebrews 2.14 uh, is a great verse that, that tells us this. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power over what? The death, the power over death, that is who? The devil. So we don't have to wonder who the death angel is. The Bible tells us who the death angel is. 
It's Lucifer, and he, is the, he has the power over the realm of death. Now, remember back to the story of Job, where we started this whole series at? Remember, God said, you can do whatever you want to Job, except you cannot take his... Why? Because Satan has the power over death. And God said, no, I'm greater than you are. You can do anything you want, but you cannot kill him. So, who is sovereign over life? There you go. Who offers eternal life? There you go. So, he's also called the red dragon. In this one, we see him in Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. And another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and his heads, seven diadems. Now, I'm not going to get into it too much here because we could get totally lost in this one. Um, but he's also called the dragon, okay, in Revelation. So we see him in future events. He's known as a devouring lion, right? We know this one. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. This one's quoted a lot. Be sober-minded, be aware, be alert. Literally, be awake, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls or hunts around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Did you know he has his own armor? How many times do we run to the armor of God in Ephesians there, right? And we say, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. I always thought it was the willies when I was little. The willies of the devil. I didn't know what wiles were uh, as, a, as a young elementary kid. So I learned that the willies of the devil. And uh, Awana later fixed it for me. And then seminary really fixed it for me. Um, but he has his own armor. And this one isn't as clear in scripture. But you can see it. Okay. Think of it this way. Take the armor of God and twist it. So he has the belt of, what's, what's the Christian belt? The belt of truth and righteousness, right? So guess what his is? His is the belt of almost truth. Almost truth. Almost truth. The breastplate of a hard heart. The shield of unbelief. The sword of deception and the shoes of lies. And his path is destruction. And the Bible teaches us all these things. They're all there. They're all prevalent throughout Scripture. So uh, the belt of almost truth, the breastplate of a hard heart, a shield of unbelief, the sword of deception, and the shoes of lies. I don't have time to get into those, but we, maybe we'll do a series on that sometime. Um, he's deceptive. We all know that, right? 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says this, No wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of what? Well, is he? He was. He, so he, he can still disguise himself. Um, 2 Corinthians eleven three says, But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 2 Thessalonians 2.9 says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power, false signs, and wonders. 1 Timothy 2.14, as Adam, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. And then even the Old Testament says it. Daniel chapter 8, verse 25, By his cunning he shall make deceit un prosper under his hand and in his own mind he shall become great without warning he shall destroy many he shall even rise up against the prince of princes shall be broken but not by human hand uh first timothy two fourteen. for by one man entered the world Right. He wasn't deceived because the woman was deceived, but he partook. Yep. Yep. He willfully chose to rebel against God's word. And in essence, rob God of his glory, which... Well, we won't go there. I'll let you... (laughs) (laughs) So... (laughs) No, I just, but no, I can see where that could be read. And I ran through the stop sign there or the comma, so, or the yield sign anyway. Revelation 12, 9, check this one on. The great dragon was thrown down, 
the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. If you ever want to know who it is, here's four of his names lined up together in construction together. And he is called not only the ancient serpent, he's not only called the devil, he's not only called Satan or the deceiver, but he deceives who? The whole world. Right in the verse, he was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. How, how many angels were thrown down with him? More than one, right? <laughs> so one third, because it says angels, plural. We know a third of the stars fell with him. Those are the angels. Here's your proof text. Revelation 12, 9 tells us that they were angels that fell with Lucifer when he fell. Not only that, but Lucifer is seductive. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1 says this. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of, say it together. Think of that. As we get closer to the end time, Second Peter is a great book to read, by the way. If you ever want to study false prophets, false teachers, what it's going to be like in the end times right before the Lord returns. Um, it expressly tells us that there will be those who had a knowledge, and we're seeing that in our time, aren't we? We're seeing pastors actually change and say, well, I was saved, but now I don't believe I'm saved. He's a false prophet. Stone him. Yeah. And you hear about modern day apostles too. That's the other one you're seeing a lot of. Um, which an apostle has to be. What, what's the qualification to be an apostle? An eyewitness to Christ. So if they're an apostle today, how are they an apostle? That's what I want to know. Uh, what, who are you that Jesus showed up in person in front of you and commissioned you for the express purpose of going out foretelling his truth. So, anyway, let, i got to keep moving here. I'm losing time fast. So, strongholds. Uh, first, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy what? Who's the holder of strongholds? Lucifer. Look at verse 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So there are those that hold the strongholds and then there's Christ that can destroy the arguments of the lofty men. That brings us to the next one. The Bible talks about strong men. Luke eleven twenty one to 22 says this. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger... Then he attacks him and overcomes him. He takes away his armor, which he trusted, and divides his spoils. What does that verse mean? Again, when we're talking about spiritual warfare, you're commanded in Ephesians to put on the what? The full armor of God. If you don't put your armor on, what are you? You're completely vulnerable to Satan. And that's what these verses tell us. When a strong man has his armor on, he can withstand. But if he doesn't have his armor on, you're going you're to be slaughtered. Satan is going to eat your lunch. Back up a verse. Oh, you want to go back to uh, back to Second Corinthians? Yep. Oh yeah. Yep. And lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. That's. Yep. As a man thinketh, so is he. Yep. Absolutely. So that's why we got to guard not just our actions, but the devil's playground, which is the mind. So I appreciate that. Matthew twelve twenty nine. Here's another one. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? 
then indeed he may plunder the whole house, right? So if you're a Christian and Satan's going to attack you, what's he got to do first? He's got to ensnare you. He's got to bind you. Yeah, lots of ways. <laughs> yeah, fear, unbelief. Well, I know God said he can, but will he? And we got a lot of that today, too. You know, will God really provide for me? You know, or, or should I go look for... Uh, Mark, by the way, Mark 3... Sorry, Mark Traeger, not you. Mark 3.27. Um, I said I thought I saw him move. Uh, Mark 3.27 says the same thing, but no one can enter a strong man's house, plunder his goods, unless he binds them together, the strong man first. Uh, but Satan is not as powerful as God is. We've got to remember this. He's powerful, but he's not as powerful as God because he was created by God. Colossians 2.14 and 15 clearly gives us this. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Nailing what to the cross? Our sin, right? He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. So how did Jesus triumph over Satan and all his devices? The resurrection. This is how Satan over or how Satan was defeated. Remember, Satan thought, hey, we got him dead. We're good. Three days later, what happened? And we know that Satan was worried about that. Why? They tried to seal the grave. They put armed guards in front of the grave. They did everything in man's wisdom to try to stop Jesus from coming out. Or somebody from stealing Jesus' body, only to find the first agent that's, that's there at the tomb that morning. Before the disciples get there, they run up and they see who? Angel sitting there. Who's validating the message? God's messengers through his people to the ones he's trying to encourage to go into all the world and preach the gospel to. So Romans 8, 37 through 39 says this, Know in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor... Nor what? Nor angels. Nor angels. What angels? The evil angels. All right? So neither angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation. In creation. Angels are what? Created. Okay? Will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So understand, angels are created. They're created beings. The Bible clearly teaches they are created beings. Daniel 4.17, the sentences by decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over the lowest, lowliest of men. Psalm 33, 10 and 11. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing, but he frustrates the plans of the peoples. You ever had God frustrate your plans? The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Revelation 20.10 says the devil who deceived them was thrown in the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump Colossians 1.16 is another great verse there. So remember we asked this a long time ago. What or who is the opposite of God? And the answer is no one. Lucifer is not the opposite of God. He's created. He's limited. He's limited in power, he's limited in scope, he's limited in kingdom. Michael is the best one that you can compare to opposite of Satan. Right, but God's not the author of fear, Satan is. So... It would have to be total fear. Because God is total love. He's all love. Yeah. Right. He is before and above all things. Here's a great, here's a great passage for you. Revelation 12.7. Check this out real quick. I've got to make sure I'm on time here today. Now war arose in heaven, and Michael and his angels fighting against two. And his angels... What? How would you like to be a witness of that war? That, 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 there's got to be some massive strikes happening there. So you got Michael fighting against two. 
his counterpart, Satan. This is, this is it right here. You see the two titans clashing over spiritual warfare. So the Bible clearly teaches that Revelation 12, 9, check this out. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent who is called the devil, Satan, deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Just two verses later from chapter, or chapter 12, verse 7 to chapter 12, verse 9, two verses, we see who wins. Michael. Michael and his angels win because who's behind them? <laughs> the one that has all power. So God created Satan, and Satan is a creature of creation. Romans eleven six, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So it is God's grace and God's mercy that we have what we have today, that Satan is bound. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, I like this verse. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, whom are all things, and for whom we exist, one Lord, Christ Jesus, through whom all things and through whom we exist. So what does that verse say? Jesus Christ is creator. <laughs> and anything that's here today is here because the creator said it should be here. Does that include Lucifer? It does. That's right. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Do you know what that verse means? You have Joe Biden as your president because God wants it. That's the application. We might not like the application, but that is the application. The senators and, and representatives we have today, we have them because God wants us to have them. Um... By the way, Satan is no match for God. So just understand that. It, it, Satan's no match for God. God will lose Satan, though. God has him on a leash. You ever think about that? At the end of the millennial reign, what's going to happen? God loses Satan. And if God loses Satan, that means who controls the dog? <laughs> God does. He's got him on a leash. He can't go any further than God allows. And then following that, he'll be cast out into everlasting darkness. Revelation 20.10, And the devil who deceived them was thrown in the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the pro false prophet are, and they will be forever tormented day and night, forever and ever. Matthew 25.46, These things will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. 2 Peter 2.4, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness, to be kept until when? The judgment. Revelation 14, 11, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Those worshipers of the beast and the image to whom whoever receives the mark of its name. And do not fear those who can kill the body, but fear those who can kill, or, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Let me jump to Satan's purpose here. I want to just show you these really quick because these are, these are impressive, okay? Satan's purpose. These are the verbs associated with Satan, okay? He's a beguiler. Nine verses of the Bible tells us that. He's a seducer. Sixty verses tell us that. He opposes. Twenty-three verses of the Bible calls him the opposer or shows him opposing believers. He's a deceiver. Fifty-six verses tells us that he is a deceiver. And that we need to be watchful and, and uh, awake. He's a resister. 38 verses. 38 verses of the Bible tell us that he resists. He sows tares. He buffets. He blasphemes. He hinders. He persecutes. Persecutes. He is the father of lies. Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, the devil, Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He has the power of satanic deception. He can blind people and they don't even see his power. They don't even see who he is. No wonder for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. He deceived Adam and Eve and Satan is the great counterfeiter. Um, I'm going to jump down here to a final illustration. Um, Satan is also a great destroyer. And um, he's called the Apollyon. Uh, Revelation 9, 11, they have a king over them. The angel of the bottomless pit, his name is in the Hebrew is Abaddon. In the Greek, he's called Apollyon. 
Uh, he hinders through adversity. Uh, he does direct attacks, fiery darts, the Bible calls them. What are some of his darts? Think of it this way. Malice, hate, greed, sensuality, jealousy, shame, discouragement. A lot of different ways. But what is Satan's destiny? Satan's destiny. He's, he's conquered enemy. The role of the world is going to be cast out. John 12 tells us. John 16 tells us concerning sin that uh, because they don't believe, they're going to be cast out and be with the Father no longer. Um, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. 1 John 3, 8 tells us that. Um, trying to jump ahead here. There's an illustration I'm looking for I want to give to you before I finish. We're told about putting on the full armor of God, right? We know that verse in Ephesians. Put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand, right? It doesn't say move forward. It doesn't mean retreat. That you might be able to stand when the darts start flying and hitting, hitting your shield. Imagine this. Satan himself is a, meeting, a worldwide meeting of deacons here. Uh, deacons, that's funny. Demons, mm. Freudian slip. He's addressing a worldwide meeting of his demons, okay? And he's giving them 12 guidelines to overcome Christians. So Satan's meeting with them. He says, and I believe he'd say something to this effect. Number one, keep them busy with non-essentials so they don't have time to do the things that God matter, that matters to God. Keep them busy with non-essentials so they don't have time to do what God expects of them. Number two, teach them to overspend and stay in debt. That way they can't do what God wants them to do. Make them work long hours to maintain empty lifestyles so they don't have time for the things of God. Discourage them from spending time with family for when homes disintegrate, there's no refuge from work. Overstimulate their minds with television, phone, streaming, social media, so they can't hear God speaking to them, for they have no idle time. Fill their coffee stands with newspapers and magazines so they have no time to read their Bible. Flood their mail and email boxes with get rich quick and lottery tickets. And keep them chasing material things so they can't think on eternal things. Put glamorous people on TV and magazines so that they'll be focused on outward appearance and become dissatisfied with themselves and dissatisfied with their mates. Make sure couples are too busy for physical intimacy so they have to look elsewhere. Emphasize Santa, Easter Bunny so you can divert them from the real purposes of the holidays. Focus kids on doing things and sports so they don't have time for the real eternal stuff that really matters and make them self-sufficient keeping them busy working in their own strength that they do not know that they don't have God's strength and they're working in their own power keep them busy you know the difference between being busy and doing what God wants you to be busy spelled how B-U-S-Y right being under Satan's yoke when we're busy when we're too busy for God we're working for the wrong person. Working for the wrong person. Satan doesn't win big battles. It's the little concessions we give to him time over time, time over time, time over time. Before we realize it, we're not doing the things that God says will give us victory in this world. We've been defeated by the enemy. That's Satan. That's what he is. That's who he is. That's what he does. So let's be alert. Be vigilant. Because our adversary is working against us and we need to start working against him and doing the things that God's called us to do. Because greater is he that's in us then. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the study. Thank you that we've uh, been able to look at these things. And I pray, Lord, that we'll be smarter Christians, being alert, being cognizant of what's going on around us so that we can be able to stand when the darts start flying and we can advance forward with your angels, your power, your Holy Spirit of God that we may be able to move forward for the cause of Christ, even in a world that is stacked heavily against us with demons and, the, and Satan's work. But Father, you gave us the power. You give us the power. You 
work through your word, through your church, through your people to advance the gospel into the darkness of the world and help us to be the light that you've called us to be, to your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.